Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 36. This is right after Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples and after Judas had been identified as the one who would betray him. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. Oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is something that was a little odd that jumped out to me in our scripture reading for this morning. I don't think that it was odd that Jesus told his followers to love one another. What I found kind of interesting or what jumped out to me, something that I noticed that I never really had before, is that Jesus told him that this was his commandment. And that's a strong word, the word commandment. It's a word that carries a lot of strength. There's not a lot of room left for debate in that. It's sort of a, you will do this, whether you like it or not. Something like a parent might say to a child when they have to take medicine. That was me as a child growing up. I didn't like medicine at all, except amoxicillin. I would take that without complaint, but pretty much everything else I would not take, and more than once, my parents had to say, you're going to do this, whether you want to or not. And I, in my own mind, I sort of see the disciples of Jesus taking his words like that way this morning, sort of like it was bad-tasting medicine. Now, the Latin word that we go to here is mandatum, and that means mandate. It's where we get our English word mandate. You will love one another. I command it, almost like there's an exclamation point at the end of that. I think that it's important to note here that Jesus did not say that we have to like one another, which I think is a good thing, because as we all know, there are some people that are more likable than others. That's a universal human truth. It's true here at the Holmes Church. It's true in families, or at least I know it's true in mine, and it was true for the disciples of Jesus. So it's a really good thing that Jesus didn't tell us that we have to like each other, or we could be in some real trouble. (laughs) Now, One of the things that you'll notice if you read through the Gospel of John is that John is not very fond of the disciple Judas. In the Gospel of John, uh, John calls Judas a thief, a a traitor, and you'll also, he doesn't really care at all for that lousy little betrayer uh, Judas. But John may have not gotten along with some of the other disciples as well because there's enough evidence from all of the Gospels to support the idea that the disciples of Jesus had their fair share of disagreements. So if the John who wrote this gospel also is the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, then we know that he and his brother made an attempt to gain the seats of honor next to Jesus when Jesus came into his kingdom, one on his left-hand side and one on his right. And I'm sure that that seemed like a good idea to them at the time, but what that really was was a power move. And not only did they misunderstand the nature of this kingdom that Jesus came to introduce them to, it was also uncharacteristic of the way that Jesus wanted his disciples to relate to each other. So again, it's a good thing that Jesus didn't command his disciples to like one another. What he asked them to do, actually it was more than ask, he commanded them to love one another. Now while they had differences, the disciples also had many things in common. Uh, For one, they were all Jews. They were from Galilee, which meant their dialects would have been similar. Their worldview might have been close to the same. From a political perspective, they may have been all part of one political party, sharing a number of common beliefs. But at the same time, I don't think that we can stretch that idea too far, because remember, one of them was a zealot and the other was a tax collector. So that would have placed Simon the zealot and Matthew the IRS agent at opposite ends of the specter of them and how they speak, get along or not get along with the Romans. Some of them were fishermen who were used to a hard life and hard work out on the sea. Others 
They have not known what it was like to work and have calloused hands. So it's a good thing that Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another. Otherwise, this whole thing would have probably not even got off the ground. But you may be asking, or what you may have thought when I read this, is that why exactly are we reading this scripture for today? Because this portion of scripture, this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, took place the night before his death. And today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. We're still celebrating Easter in the church. So wouldn't this scripture passage maybe be better in the season of Lent? Or if not in Lent, maybe just an ordinary time? Why include it in Easter? It's a good question. And here's my thoughts on that. Out of the four Gospels that we have, John spends the most time giving what is known as the farewell discourse. Um, all the Gospels have some of the final sayings of Jesus, but that's what John spends a lot of time on. It was a really big deal for him. It was really important for him. And looking back on that, Jesus is telling his disciples what he is now telling us. So if you don't mind, let me try and set the stage where I, for what I see Jesus uh, saying and what he's describing here. They've just come in off the road. They have sweat on their faces. There's dust all over them. Back then, it was almost impossible to go anywhere without getting sweaty and dusty. And along the way, they had been arguing about who was going to be the greatest in this kingdom that Jesus kept talking about. Now, the teachings of Jesus, as well as his interactions with the religious authorities, had given the disciples the impression that things were about to come to a head. And if they had figured, things figured out correctly, and again, in hindsight, we know that they didn't, but if they did, this kingdom was about to come into existence. So the major item on their agenda was to see what role they would all be playing in this kingdom. Because if things played out just right, they might be able to come out of this looking pretty good. So James and John, the Zebedee brothers, decide that they're going to make sure that Jesus knows where it is they stand. So on this little journey, they tried to claim the seats of honor, like I said. And since they couldn't really keep something like that a secret, all the other disciples know about what they have done. And they're not real happy about it. They actually might have been more aggravated they weren't the ones to think of it themselves. So Jesus, knowing that this is the mood of his disciples, takes a water and a basin and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And that changes the mood in the room. It goes from anger to guilt. Because the disciples knew if there was anyone in that room who should not be on their knees washing their feet, that would be Jesus. But before they have a chance to wallow in their guilt too much, Jesus tells them that one of them is going to betray him. And the mood changes again, because now paranoia is the name of the game. And once Judas has been identified as the betrayer and has gone to do his work, it is then that Jesus gives the remainder of the disciples the mandate to love. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. You know, every family at some point in time find themselves in crisis mode, at least at one point. Every family will go through difficult times. It might be the death of somebody. It might be that someone has been diagnosed with a serious illness. It might be that you're deciding what to do with your parents once they get to an age where they're unable to care for themselves any longer. It could be a number of different things, but every family goes through these times. And the big question is, when those times come in, what is it that you do? Well, you, you get together. You talk about what you're going to do with this struggle that has come your way. And if there's differences among you, even if those differences are big, at that point, you lay those aside because your personal desires are not important when it comes to dealing with a crisis at hand. So the conversation that Jesus is having here with his disciples is that kind of family talk. It was a time for him to lay out for his disciples what it is that he expects of them. Because there is a crisis ahead. He knows it. The disciples sense it. So he says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. And in my own mind, this is what I see as a result of what he just said. I just imagine this incredible silence. Dead silence. Remember, Judas had gone into the darkness of betrayal. And when that happened, it was almost like the disciples were allowed to breathe again because when there was a betrayer present, 
they were holding everything in because they were all busy questioning whether they were the betrayer themselves. Now that Judas had been identified, it was almost like they were allowed to breathe once again. But then Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. And with that, it was like all the oxygen was once again sucked out of the room and they were left gasping for air. And there's nothing left but this incredible dead silence. If it was made of butter, you could have cut it with a proverbial knife. And the disciples knew that if anyone was going to cut through this silence, it was going to have to be Jesus. And there are different kinds of silence. There can be awkward silence when you and someone else don't exactly know what to say to each other. Sometimes silence is wonderful because words don't have the power to convey the feelings that are present. And there are other times when anger can create silence. You don't really know how to respond to what is being said. And even if you could respond, it's not the right time and it might not come out right. So you try your, find yourself trying to settle your emotions so that you just don't explode. And I wonder if that was the kind of silence that was in the upper room that night. When Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. One of the questions might be is, what to do exactly about love? I mean, what is this new commandment? Loving others, is that something that's really new? Well, thinking about love, and forgive me for reducing such an important point to a comic strip, but this is one that I found in my dad's office several weeks after he had died. And it was one of his favorites, Peanuts. And in this clip, Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown, and, and Lucy says to him, you know what I don't understand, Charlie Brown? I don't understand love. And Charlie Brown says, well, who does? So Lucy says, well, explain love to me, Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown says, I can't explain love. I mean, I could recommend a book or a poem or a painting, but I, I can't explain love. And Lucy says, well, try, Charlie Brown, try. So Charlie Brown says, well, let's say, for example, that I see this cute little girl walk by. And Lucy interrupts him saying, who says she got to be cute, huh? Why can't someone be cute with freckles and a big nose? So Charlie Brown says, oh, okay, maybe you're right. So let's say I see this girl walk by with this great big nose. Lucy interrupts him again, this time shouting, I didn't say great big nose, and storms off. And hanging his head as he often did when dealing with Lucy, Charlie Brown says, not only can you not explain love, you can't even talk about it. <laughs> now, I don't know if Charlie Brown had it right. Maybe you can or you can't talk about love, but that certainly didn't stop the Apostle Paul in the second uh, chapter of Philippians, he describes how Jesus modeled the kind of love that he wants the disciples to have for one another. And chapter two is, contains a great Christ hymn. And in that, he said this, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped or held onto, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus said, just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. And it was then that he went out and showed them exactly what kind of love that was by dying on the cross. And for that indescribable love. I say thanks be to God. Amen.